Hello and welcome back to my hangar. As you see the airplane's back together again, it's great to be back in the air. I'd like to give an update on the overhaul process and some of the things that I learned along the way. As you may recall, this all started with an excessive mag drop during run-up. It seemed like a good project for the annual coming up in a week. And sure enough, we found and fixed a carbon track inside the bending steam mag. But on reassembly, things just didn't look right. Researching a little further, we could see the drive gear had an extra ring of material from somewhere. Looking closer, it was clear that the bushing had spun, so this case is not going to be flying like this. Thinking about root causes, you know, the bushings are moved during case work. Every time they rebore the case, it gets a little closer together, and the bushings have to be moved back out a couple thousands. So this case had been redone twice, so you know, maybe the bushing wasn't staked. It's hard to say. You know, in theory, it can be fixed, but in any case, the engine's going to have to come out for IRAN, pulled apart, case sent back, re-welded, re-drilled, re re-staked. So... Time to take the engine out. There's a lot of little things to disconnect, but it goes remarkably quickly. And pretty soon the engine is ready to go to Poplar Grove for IRAM. You know, it still looks like new, as it should after only 300 hours. So let's talk about my engine choices. My airplane's always had a D-Mag. It's an IL360 A1B6D engine. That means it has a D-Magneto with Bendix dual magneto. That magneto has both mags inside the same case. Now the magneto guys told me that this is a great magneto. Um, good voltage, easy to work on, reliable, there's thousands of them in the marketplace. Um, but some people are concerned about the fact that those two magnetos are in the same enclosure. If one of them blows up in some way and sheds parts, those parts theoretically propagate to the other side. Maybe so, but I've overhauled this engine twice and I stayed with the D engine. To me it wasn't that big of a factor. Um, it always worked really well for me. And you know, it, people worry about single source magneto parts. You know, can you get parts for it or not? Well, Kelly does a pretty good job. You know, they've got cases now and they've got the parts. And you might say, well, it's not good to have a single source for pricing reasons. But you know, there's, uh, there's competitive pressures to keep them honest about that, I think. And, uh, and there's thousands of them working, right? Out, out, they're flying out there in 172s and all kinds of airplanes. You have the D-Mags. So there's a big population, and when there's a big population, very often people come into the market to satisfy the, the, uh, the, the demand. So I'm not that down on the D-Mag specifically, but sort of interesting that my failure mode was not the D-Mag, but it was the bushing on the gear that drives the D-Mag, which is another single point of failure. Now it's steel gears and metal parts, and you might think, well, it's pretty reliable, but mine failed. And to be honest, I was lucky that I found it on the ground. So I'm thinking, you know, there's another factor in play here, which is I'd really kind of like to have an electronic ignition, right? The Surefly just really intrigues me. And so I think I'd like to go to a separate mag so I can have the electronic ignition. And it'll get rid of that failure point because the A1B6 engines, the non-D engine, doesn't even have that bushing that failed on my engine. The, uh, the bearings in the, in the magnetos hold the gears in the right place and carry the load of the gears. So um, I made the decision to change to a non-D engine. I talked to our, my friends at Poplar Grove, the shop that I really wanted to have do the overhaul, and they said, yeah, we've done that before. We've got a list of parts. We know what it takes. They ran that list of parts through their pricing process, about $10,000. And they couldn't find the crank. They were calling all over. They couldn't find an A1B6 crank. So they kind of tossed it back in my court, and they said, well, if you can find us a crank, then here's the deal. You know, $10,000 for the parts. Your old ones have some trade-in value. Uh, let's see what we can do. And uh, so I made some calls and I was very fortunate. One of the first calls I made was up to Wentworth. You know, Steve and the guys up there do a nice job of making parts available for us. And lo and behold, they had one in hand. Pretty good price. Came out of a, uh, a Scottish bulldog that had, had a, a nose over incident, so it did have a prop strike. But they promised it would, it would dial indicate, the flange would indicate properly, would, would, uh, would dial out as, as a straight flange. So I made him a deal on that engine, had him ship it down, and um, Poplar Grove said they were willing to assemble an engine from the assortment of parts from the two engines, but they didn't have time to tear the engine down. They're just so busy up there. They said, you know, we couldn't schedule it for a, a quite a period of time. And I said, well, you know, I've torn engines down before. How about if I tear the engine down? And I'll bring you all the parts, all bagged and boxed and protected and uh, ready to go. And they, uh, they said that they were willing to do that. Now, I was very kind of them. Um, I'm not sure if they would do that today <laughs> because they've been increasingly busy and it's increasingly challenging, I think, to service this market and the, and the way things are you know, post-COVID. But uh, they very kindly uh, accepted the proposal and 
And so my next job now was to get the engine in and disassemble it and pack it up and send it off to Poplar Grove for assembly. Soon enough, the crate arrived and the disassembly project began. My son Mike helped. We made a video of this process, which you might have seen. One good bit of news was that this shape on the side of the case tells us that this is a high crush case. This is the latest version of case from uh, Lycoming. There are some tricks to splitting the case, but it all went smoothly. So we had a table full of small parts and a pallet full of large parts. All boxed up, they're ready to go. It may be interesting to see what tools were required for this task. Now we wait for the parts to be inspected and blessed, and then the engine will be assembled. So I'm just waiting for a phone call. In due time, I got the call to come see my engine run. This was my first look. It was mounted in their test cell with an adjustable fixed pitch load prop. They actually have two test cells. This is the old one. It shows signs of constant improvement over many years with a rail system to move the test rig in and out of the warm shop. You can see all the connections available to run the engine. Also note the short exhaust pipes, which predict a noisy test run. They were kind enough to start it up a few times and run it for me. They have a test plan which includes two hours of running at various power settings. Here's how it looks during the test. Now the action moves to Aviation Plus, Bob Russell's shop in Kenosha. My Cardinal's brought out of long-term storage and prepped for the engine. Engine's looking even more new, getting some baffling installed here ahead of time. Quentin did a lot of the installation work. There were many boxes of parts to install and several modifications, some of them due to the change of engine type. One such challenge was the oil pressure fitting port. It needs a fitting with an orifice to limit flow in case of a leak. On this new accessory housing, that port points directly at the engine mount, which we're looking through here. So the usual straight fitting won't work. A 90 degree angle fitting seems like an option, but it doesn't have enough clearance to swing. I later found a similar engine which shows how they are usually drilled. The rear facing port we see here would have worked fine for me, but my housing doesn't have that port. The final solution was a pair of fittings to snake through the open space, both made of steel for strength. I also pulled a new wire from the tail for the Surefly mag, modified the governor bracket for the non-D engine, added a snubber to the manifold pressure line, and installed the new Hartzell Trailblazer prop. Then there were the normal things, like sealing around the top engine baffle, sealing the head portion of the baffle in front of the number two cylinder, and trying to fill up the through holes. Of course, there's always one more thing, and in my case it was the throttle cam. Luckily, I had one on hand. Eventually, with everything checked and double-checked, it was time for a first flight. Bob Russell's at the controls. He invited me along as required crew, but I figured if anything went wrong, he didn't need the distraction of having me along. So that's the story. There will likely be more videos about some of the modifications, but overall, I'm very happy with the result. And I'm pleased with the performance. Notice the true airspeed of 151 knots here on a 67 degree day in level flight. It's treated well by Poplar Grove and Aviation Plus, especially since this was unexpected. You know, coming up an annual like this without uh, any pre-planning, they both worked me into their very busy schedules and gave me a result that's really better than I could have imagined. Once again, I'm very glad to be back in the air again. Thanks for riding along.